Welcome to the Alpha Architect Weekly Summary. Uh, we got Dr. Jack Vogel here with us. So we're going to go through the three research articles that were posted on our site this week, uh, starting with how leverage constraints affect mutual fund risk taking. This summary was done by Larry Swedro. So there's a lot here. Uh, to keep this video to 15 minutes, we're going to try to keep this one high level. Uh, we'll try to give you those watching at home, uh, like just a better understanding. There's some pretty interesting results discussed. Um, uh, but so in the blog post, mm -hmm. Larry combined a few different research pieces to look at what we call the betting against beta strategy. So to start for the, for the dumb people out there like me, uh, what... Uh, what is beta? Yeah, so, so beta is a way just to measure how much a stock, or you could measure at a mutual fund or ETF level, but in that paper, how a stock kind of varies and moves along with the market, right? So a beta of two, right, would be if, you know, if the, you would say in general, if the market was up 10% and the stock had a beta of two, one would expect, you know, in a cap M world that it would be up 20%. Right, because it's two times. If it's a beta of a half, right, that means it moves about as half of the market. So if the market's up 10%, you'd expect it to be up around 5%. So technically, it's a mathematical definition. It's either, you know, the correlation between a stock and the market, and, you know, multiplied by the uh, standard deviation of the stock divided by standard deviation of the market, or the covariance divided by standard deviation of the market. So mathematically, but my examples probably is more yeah. high level what people understand. More layman's terms. Um, okay, so that's beta. Then what is betting? Uh, what is the betting against beta strategy? Yeah, so the the betting against beta strategy is an interesting one because in general, what we are all taught is that you know the riskier the investment, the higher the return. Right? You obviously all else equal wouldn't take on a riskier investment if you didn't expect a higher return. And so <clears throat> what the betting against beta strategy does is it actually kind of says, well, maybe that's not necessarily the case. And that's what is known as having the flat security market line, um, which we can send you a link to a post on that. But essentially what they do is you sort securities based on their beta. So if you have a thousand stocks, you would you know, run their betas yeah. uh, against the market and get a thousand betas. And what the betting against beta factor does is it, goes long, low beta stocks. These are supposed to be like, you know, stocks that are safer or less risky. Yep. Okay. And it levers it up a little bit to make it a beta of one. And then it goes short high beta stocks and it delevers that portfolio. So it's a dollar neutral portfolio. And essentially what you would do is if I had two stocks, right? And I had stock A with a beta of a half, I would go long stock A and I buy 200% or two times it, so now it has a beta of one. And if stock B had a beta of two, I would go short stock B with you know 50% of my capital because two times 0.5 or a half is one. And so and what has been found is this betting against beta factor actually has a positive expected return. Where you go long, low beta securities that you lever up, and you go short, high beta securities that you de-lever. Okay. And then, and so the, there, there were three articles mentioned, um, but what, what, what do those papers, what, what's the research, like the summary of the research in those? Yeah, so Larry highlighted three papers in that post, and the first one just kind of gave you the original paper called Betting Against Beta, yeah. right? And what that found was that not only for U.S. stocks, but for international stocks, um, stock indices, even in other asset classes, Right, this betting against beta anomaly holds, whereas low beta securities levered up, going long them, going short high beta securities has a positive expected return for you. Yep. So that's the first paper. And then the second two papers that Larry references talk specifically about almost kind of how one could time or when a betting against beta factor may work better mm -hmm. uh, in certain situations. So. When the first paper talks about leverage constraints, and what it finds is that when leverage constraints are high, and they measure that in that paper by the actively managed mutual funds average beta, right? So a higher beta means that in that paper, 
means that the actively managed mutual funds are having you know some constraint because they don't want to lever up. So they're just taking on more growth stock risk essentially or higher beta stock risk. Yep. And what they find is that the betting against beta factor works better, uh, at least historically worked better when the there was higher leverage constraints. Right? Higher, so, higher leverage constraints within the mutual funds? Uh, as measured. As measured. as measured by that. And it's a little more technical, but high level, that's the idea. Um, and then the second paper, which is actually by AQR, um, talks about just looking at the betting against beta factor and uh, discussing how it does when you're examining past stock returns. Mm -hmm. And what they find is that uh, if the past stock returns were higher, the betting against beta factor does better in the future. Um, and so with the betting against beta, could we call this low volatility? Is it the same effect? It, it's a similar effect. Um, yeah, it, it's similar to the low volatility effect. Um, a lot of times when people measure low vol, you can either measure it uh, on a standalone basis, just the volatility of the individual stock. But sometimes people use what's called idiosyncratic volatility, which takes out some of the market volatility. And you know, it's related, idiosyncratic volatility is related to a beta measure. Slightly different, but they're highly related. So yes. Well, so that's gonna uh, take us a little bit in the next one. So then the, the next paper written was, uh, it was called The Conservative Formula, Quantitative Investing Made Easy. Uh, the authors of this paper, took they took a simple hypothesis. Can we select 100 stocks from a universe of 1,000 based on three criteria? Uh, low return volatility, high net payout yield, and strong price momentum. Um, and can we select from those and then outperform the market? So again, so we're all on the same page, we'll break these three things down. So Jack, uh, first, what is low return volatility, which you just kind of covered? Yeah, we, we kind of just covered it somewhat. It's kind of like the low beta anomaly. Um, so that's kind of the first factor. Yep. Yeah. So that's the first factor, rewind. Similar. But rewind yeah. if you have to. Uh, what what is high net payout yield? Yeah, so net payout yield is um, there's the Boudicca paper of 2007 discusses how in the past, you know, going back, let's say to the, the 50s or before, or even to the mid 70s, you know, dividend yield was the main way in which an investor received funds back from a company, right? Mm -hmm. But then as tax laws changed, firms as well as firms, CEOs, possibly like the flexibility of being able to, you know, have a non-sticky dividend, but use uh, buybacks to return capital to shareholders. Yeah, so we're not gonna get into shareholder buybacks <laughs> here and the political implications. But so what we're gonna discuss though is that what uh, that paper found is that Wait, if you hit the third one before you go to that the third one What is what is strong price momentum because we got low return volatility high net payout yield and then strong price momentum was the third So just to find that roughly. yeah, so so price momentum is essentially just looking at the past returns of stocks and Historically the winners it, using intermediate term momentum the winners have continued to win and the losers have continued to lose Got it. Okay, so then so now we combine all these. We're selecting 100 stocks from a universe of 1,000 using these three criteria. Um, and and what, did the, what did the paper say? Yeah, I mean, it's similar to, you know, it's a kind of multi-factor strategy, yep. right? So what it does is it, uh, I think this is accurate, uh, it takes the universe of top 1,000 stocks, right? And it splits them first on volatility. So now you have 500 stocks because you picked the low vol stocks, not the high ones. Yep. And then within there, you rank stocks on net payout yield, i.e. those repaying funds to shareholders either through dividends or repurchases, net repurchases, right? Or momentum, right? And they think you have a 50-50 weighting to uh, the net payout yield and the momentum factor. Mm -hmm. And they then just pick the top 100 stocks from there. And yeah, it's a pretty good strategy. Yeah. Um, it's kind of similar related to, you know, Med Faber's shareholder yield, does a similar idea. Uh, Mev has the, you know the repurchase plus some debt pay down as his main filter to get to 100 stocks. Got it. And uh, yeah, so I guess we we can say you can do simpler things and achieve similar goals. You you don't necessarily have to do something super complicated. 
Yeah, I mean, historically, there's been four or five factors, you know, we're going to discuss them soon, but, you know, value, quality, size, momentum, uh, and low volatility. And we just discussed low vol, right? Yeah. We just discussed momentum. Yeah. And then the repurchase yield or the payout yield is related, not exactly the same, but it's highly related to value. Yeah. Well, so good. So then, so then the third paper this week, uh, it, it was called what's in your benchmark, a factor analysis of major market indexes. Uh, so this article examines how much factor exposure is present in five common benchmarks, the S and P 500, the Russell 1000, the Russell 1000 value, the Russell 1000 growth and the Russell 3000. Uh, there's two questions. The authors of these papers asked, and that is, do the factor exposures of market cap index portfolios typically used to benchmark investment performance vary by index? That's the first question they asked. And then the second question was, have those exposures changed over time? So momentum, oh yeah, well, let's take a step back again. So what, what factors are we looking at? And, and you can kind of already hit on it, but. Yeah, so what, what the authors do in that paper and, you know, to figure out exactly what they're doing, um, you have to dig into details because they have another paper that talks about their methodology. But they're going to examine five factors. So it's going to be value, momentum, size, quality, and low volatility, right? And what they're going to attempt to do is to tie, try to take those five common market cap weighted indices yep. and using only long only factor strategies, which they proxy as like the MSCI value, momentum, quality, size, low volatility indices, right? So these are long only investable type strategies. Right. And these, these authors are, they're from BlackRock. So they're going to, yeah, they're going to yeah. use like BlackRock relevant indexes. Yeah. Those are all indices that there's ETFs on, yeah. right? And so what they're going to do is attempt to say, Hey, here's the S and P 500. Can I, replicate this with one of these five long only factors mm -hmm. and that's what their methodology does so if you look at the weightings of these it's always like a hundred percent so you could say the s p 500 i forget the exact numbers but let's say it's you know 55 percent momentum 45 percent quality yep. right and zero to the other three and what they find is they actually have a very good uh, accuracy of predicting kind of the indice returns using their methodology with those specific factors okay. Okay, um, so then, so I guess back to the uh, uh, first question, do the factor exposures of market cap index portfolios typically used to benchmark investment performance vary by index? Yeah, they, they definitely do, definitely. right? So Pretty intuitive, but. I think we all expect, you know, the Russell 1000 value has a larger exposure to the MSCI value index or not, ex not exposure. I don't know if that's the correct way. It's using their methodology as a higher weighting to value relative than the Russell 1000 growth, which has a higher value to momentum. Right? So yes, it does vary from, from passive market cap indices to, to each other. Right. And, and, and I imagine it varies over time as well. Right. Yeah. So the S&P 500 has, as we said, making up the numbers, 50% exposure to momentum today, but according to this research, it could have, you know, two years ago, it could have been 45%. Right? Yeah, so yeah. and exactly if you look at the paper, the authors show how their weightings vary over time, which is neat. Yeah. What's, what's the significance then of asking these questions, these benchmarking questions? Why, why does it matter? Yeah, so, you know, it's kind of highlighted, discussed slightly in the conclusion of the paper, but, you know, I, I think, probably a good takeaway from that is that, you know, even if you are, let's say a, you, you think of yourself as a passive investor, right? You, you have Russell 1000, you know, big index or the S and P 500, uh, kind of what the authors are showing here is that, you know, you really do have exposure because they can show with like very high, tr very low tracking error, right? That you really have exposure to these other like value, momentum, quality, low vol or size factors, mm -hmm. right? And so why is that important? Well, you know, for some investors or even for other advisors who may want to supplement, let's say like a passive market cap weighted portfolio yeah. with maybe some other factor type long only portfolio, yeah. like all else equal, if you own the Russell 1000, which let's just say for 
example's sake, is 50% momentum and 50% quality. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, which I don't think that is, but if that's the case, then you would obviously want to use other factors such as value, low vol, or size, because you, you don't want to be you know just putting more of the same thing into your portfolio. So it's an interesting idea to basically break down these market cap indices into kind of what you could get from the factor side. Well, that, that concludes our uh, Alpha Architect weekly research summary. You can check out these research posts more in depth on our blog at alphaarchitect.com. Uh, thank you for listening. The views expressed in this recording are the personal views of the participants as of the date indicated and do not necessarily reflect the views of Alpha Architect itself. Nothing contained in this recording constitutes investment, legal, tax, or other advice and should not be viewed as a current or past recommendation or a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities, or to adopt any investment strategy. The information in this recording is based on current market conditions which will fluctuate and may be superseded by subsequent market events or for other reasons. Alpha Architect does not resume any duty to update forward-looking statements. The information in this recording has been developed internally and or obtained from sources believed to be reliable. However, no representation or warranty expressed or implied, is made or given by or on behalf of Alpha Architect as to the accuracy and completeness or fairness of the information contained in this recording. Any liability as a result of this recording, including direct, indirect, special, or consequential loss or damage is expressly disclaimed. Copyright 2018, Alpha Architect LLC. All rights reserved.